But now let me uh, turn the floor to Professor John Torchieri from the Ford School who will introduce our speakers today. John. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. And thank you very much to our, our dynamic duo of speakers. I'm going to introduce them briefly, and you can find more uh, information about their impressive biographies uh, in the flyer. Uh, Pasuk Pongpachit is a professor of economics at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, certainly one of Southeast Asia's finest universities. And she's written on a wide range of topics, including the theme of, of uh, prospects for democracy in Thailand, but also uh, involving studies on the uh, sex industry, corruption, uh, illegal business in Thailand, and she has the distinction of perhaps the most alluring title for an academic book that I've heard in a, in a, in a good few years, Guns, Girls, Gambling, Ganja, Thailand's Illegal Economy and Public Policy. Uh, she's also written uh, books on, on corruption and democracy in Thailand, and she's co-authored a number of books with our uh, second uh, guest expert, Chris Baker, who in a former life taught history and politics, uh, Asian history and politics at Cambridge University from where he received his PhD. Uh, in this incarnation, he is a, uh, a writer uh, based in Bangkok and uh, he has edited a number of issues of leading journals on topics related to Thai and Southeast Asian politics uh, and history. He's also translated a number of works, a uh, few of which include works by King Rama V and by the Communist Party of Thailand. So it's very, very wide-ranging uh, expertise. And what impresses me so much about our two guests today is that while very impressive individually, uh, even more so uh, as a pair. They've written a number of books on different topics in the last decade, including a book on Thaksin Shinawatra, whom I'm sure you'll hear referenced in today's talk, uh, A History of Thailand, which is a book published in 2005, as well as books about Thai economy and politics related to the financial crisis and other periods in Thai history. Um, I've enjoyed reading a number of your pieces in the Bangkok Press, in, in the uh, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Uh, and so we very much look forward to hearing your talk today. With that, I'll turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. And all those uh, beautiful titles, is, have to thank Chris. He's a very good title thinker. Can we get a little bit of the light away from the screen? Is that possible? We have changed the title because, of course, you have to change the title. But this is also because there is an election uh, about to come up. So we have re-geared uh, the speech today more to the election and the issues around this election. So it still deals with red and yellow, but red and yellow has got a little bit boring, so we've moved a little bit beyond that. The Thai Prime Minister recently announced he would dissolve the Parliament on 3rd of May meaning a general election will take place in late June, around six months ahead of the deadline. This is much more than just another election because of the recent history. The results of the last three elections have been overturned in different ways. One was voided by the courts, another was overthrown by a military coup, and a third was negated, wherein a court judgment dissolved the ruling party. What's more, in 2009, and again in 2010, Thailand was rocked by street demonstrations whose principal demand was to have an election. The, cost, the government refused that demand and brought in the military to dissolve the protests. And in the last occasion in May 2010, the death toll is now 93, the injury toll is up to around 1,000, and 30-odd buildings were torched. What's even more, the call, this call for an election has been greeted by total dismay from some very powerful figures. Sotsi Satyatum, member of the Election Commission, said outright, I don't want an election, because it would lead to a revolution from below, like in North Africa. Some prominent journalists have voiced the fear, fear that the election might lead to the return of the ousted premier, Taksin Shinawat, and therefore more conflict. And for several months, there have been constant rumours of a coup, an open discussion about forming a, quote, national government, which means an unelected one. Several business figures have spoken longingly about the China model, meaning an authoritarian government that oversees rapid economic growth. 
in a, a survey done by the Asia Foundation released two weeks ago between last year and this year, the number of people in Bangkok who say they strongly support democracy as the model for Thailand dropped from 57% to 27%. Sonti Limtomkun, who was head of the Yellow Shirt People's Alliance for Democracy, which has been so powerful in the last couple of years, went further. He said we need to shut down the government for three to five years so we can clean away the dirt in the political system. The, the rhetoric of the PAD over time has been coming, taken on more and more of the flavor of fascist, uh, fascist rhetoric of several decades ago. It's very strange for a premier to announce the dissolution ahead of time, giving away the advantage of surprise to the opposition. Clearly, there's a special reason he did so. There's a rumor that he also brought in a foreign research company to carry out an opinion poll in order to show to his bosses, which means the military, that he has a chance of winning so that they will let him run this election. So this is more just, much more than just another an election. It's an election about whether Thailand should continue having a semblance of parliamentary democracy or not. And at this point, the result is far from certain. So we want to address today how did Thailand get to this point and what happens next? And in order to answer the question that Chris posed properly, uh, we, would, we need to look at the socio-economic and political context in which uh, those conflicts have arisen. Uh, first, I will, uh, look at, uh, we will look at the inequalities as a background and followed by the challenge uh, which further led to the reaction. Okay. Thailand is a very unequal society compared to its neighbor and compared to countries of similar level of development. Income inequality has worsened steadily over the years and has improved only a little in recent years. Inequality in the ownership of assets is even more staggering. The top 10% own 69% more than the bottom 10%. 69 times. 69 times more than the bottom 10%. And you can see also that the, the difference between the second, uh, this second uh, quintile and the first quintile is also still very marked. Uh, this is a situation not only in Thailand, you find it in the US, similar kind of figure would be re represented in terms of the top 1% having this huge gap. Economic inequality does not of itself create political division or conflict, but it certainly forms a background against which other forms of inequality, political, social, and cultural also worsen. In particular, power and access to power are very badly distributed. Thailand is ruled by a kind of oligarchy. As its base are three old institutions which have never been reformed. First, there is the bureaucracy, which developed from an old feudal nobility and still conceives of itself as a ruling caste. Distinguished from the mass of the people by the uniforms, rituals, grand architecture, and other marker of differences. The second, the military, that rule, the military ruled the country for half a century, is still highly politicized and believe it has a special role in the polity, a right of intervention. And third, we have the monarchy, who has tended to grow stronger and take a more intrusive role in politics, as the length of the reign has steadily, steadily enhanced the monarch's personal status. And we must also recognize that in Thailand, there has been no mass movement which has challenged these <coughs> old institutions, like in many other countries, which has anti-colonial movements that serve the purpose. The new urban middle class that developed over the past century, and especially over its latter half, has tended, is small in number, and has tended to ally itself with the old elite, rather than 
challenging it. And that's partly because this middle class is rather small and insecure, and this middle class did try to promote elected, elective democracy in the 1970s and early 1990s to end absolutism and to control the military. But it stopped there. In this situation, the ideologies which justify privilege remain in place. The distribution of public goods is very unequal. There is no effort to institute the rule of law as that would undermine that privilege. Uh, next, uh, let, it, let us look at the challenge which happened with the challenge to this oligarchy and the uh, concentration of power situation. Over recent years, the situation has come under serious challenge. And this challenge is essentially uh, political with underlying economic. The political is a demand for inclusiveness, for more equitable access to power and better distribution of public goods. The demand has been largely mounted through the ballot box. The background to this challenge lies in the great economic change of the past decades. You can see in this graph, Today, the average Thai has an income three times that of his parents and six times that of his grandparents. All style peasant farming has virtually disappeared and replaced by market-oriented agriculture. Many have moved from the village to the city, while others rotate between the rural and urban economies. And even in the countryside itself, the lifestyle and uh, the urban facilities have also increased. The inequities in Thai society may not have got significantly worse in recent decades, but far more people are in a position to see them, understand them, and resent them. With rising incomes, people have more education, more access to information, more access to pr protect, more assets to protect, different hopes and desires for themselves and especially for their children. And more demands on government, obviously, for public goods, for legal process, and so on. Yet many people find that they are blocked by some kind of glass ceilings of various kinds. Power is still so concentrated in the capital, opportunities are monopolized by the old elite, and established middle class. School have spread everywhere, but the quality of the school are very varied. And good, you find good school in Bangkok and big cities, but not in the provincial uh, area. And you'll be surprised to find that 80% of Thai households still do not have access to tap water. They have access to tap water in their households. They can use tap water, but they have to go and get it from somewhere into the household. Uh, the, moreover, the old elite and middle class often continue to treat provincial and lower echelon of people as if they were all still as poor and uneducated as they were two generations ago. Jung Sak Bin Thong, a former academic turned media personality, said on television, just before all this problem, that the most a Northeasterner could aspire to become is Petro Pam Boy, Dek Pam, or a house servant, Kod Lap Chai. This remark was highly resented. During the demonstrations in central Bangkok last May, newspaper ran cartoons showing the demonstrators as buffaloes, and opponents held up signs calling them uneducated people showing how deeply uneducated they themselves are. You can see in the, here. Resentment gathered through the 1990s, expressed largely through grassroots organization and protest campaign on rural issues like land rights, access to natural resources, agricultural prices. By and large, these campaigns were not successful. The government either suppressed them or ignored them, meaning that resentment festered. In the 80s and 90s, there was no attempt to use the ballot box to pursue change. 
The parliament was not conceived as an institution through which the mass of the people could affect change. It was a captive of money. Rich candidates invested large sums in direct or indirect vote buying, ensuring that wealth was a qualification for admission as an MP. Over three quarters of the seats were occupied by male business entrepreneurs who represented less than 3% of the total population. The parliament operated largely as a businessmen's club, sharing out the budget and networking among themselves and negotiating with the bureaucracy. For the ordinary tie, the parliament was remote and unimportant to their lives. That situation changed completely over a decade that began in 1997. The vote became something of value. And in this process, Thaksin Shinawatra, the billionaire businessman who turned politician, played an important role. <coughs> However, we need to look at the background first. First came the 1997 financial crisis. It caused real pain for those in the middle and lower ranks of society, <coughs> prompting a massive wave of protest and further politicization. It also undermined the confidence and the legitimacy of the old ruling oligarchy, creating cracks from which new political trends could emerge. Second, in the 1997 constitution, adopted in the teeth of opposition from the old oligarchy during the turmoil crisis, significantly and significantly decentralized power to elective local government bodies. Up to this point, a Thai citizen had voted only once every three to four years for the parliament, which seemed so remote, as I mentioned. And, but as a result of decentralization and other reforms, the citizens now voted not only for an MP, but also a senator, village head, local councillor, mayor, and provincial council. Through the decentralization of power, though the decentralization of power was still rather limited in the election for local government, citizens voted for candidates they knew and were in a position to evaluate their contribution. In short, there was a rapid education in the value of the franchise, the vote to bring about direct material benefits. And this brought about a revolution in the structure of local politics in the years that follow. Before, MPs and prospective MPs had funneled patronage down to a range of local brokers in the green, uh, in this one. Uh, local officials, prominent businessmen, lottery agents, gangsters who get out, who could get out the world and work as canvassers. Now local leaders, factions, and activist groups emerge. They could bargain among prospective candidates for their support, or bypass them altogether and deal directly with the political parties and central government agencies, and sometimes support all MPs. The transformation was not total. Patronage still matters. Circumstances differ from locality to locality, but as a whole, politics became more susceptible to pressure from below. The third factor of change stemming from 1997 was Thaksin Shinawat, who served as a channel funneling the rising pressure from below into national politics. Thaksin made a multi-billion fortune from a near monopoly concession to run the first mobile phone service. He launched into politics and was elected prime minister in 2001. He then vastly increased his family fortune by abuse of power, but also because he became a leader of this force bubbling up from below. We want to highlight the circumstances rather than the man. The situation was ripe for the emergence of a popular leader of some kind. In other words, we think that if there had been no taxin, there could have been someone else who would, took, who would take his place. And Taksin did not fully understand this when he launched his bid for power in 1998 and 2001. 
he presented himself as a successful businessman who would primarily represent the interests of the business and whose main goal was achieving rapid economic growth. But as he gradually lost middle class support, he gradually transformed himself into a highly attractive popular leader. How he did, how he did it? First, he enacted some simple distributive reforms, universal health care, microcredit, agricultural price support, which had a big impact on ordinary people. He showed that national politics could bring about change that affected the lives of the people directly. Second, his health scheme in particular, which offered the same benefit to everybody, everybody as a right, uh, encapsulated a new concept of the citizen and hence was popular far beyond the actual usage of the scheme. And here, a study has shown that the universal health care scheme has reduced the poverty level by one third because it reduced the cost of health care for ordinary people. Third, Taksin increasingly cultivated a close, hot relationship between leader and people through the media, through upcountry tours, and through rhetoric, which was very different from the cool, aloof model of the old oligarch position politics. In worldwide perspective, this style was the standard of mass politicians in a media-drenched age, but in Thailand it's something very revolutionary and very new. And Thaksin was rewarded with rock star-like acclaim. People felt his leadership empowered them. Fourth, as he grew to understand and to like his support, Thaksin became more radical in his rhetoric. He increasingly not only distinguished himself from the old oligarchy, bureaucrats, old-style politicians, and the journalists, and Ajahn co-opted into uh, into the old oligarchic culture, but he criticized them and reveled in their criticism of him. By doing so, he tapped reserves of resentment, normally hidden from sight in Thailand, repressed political culture. Now we want to follow the reaction to this that has taken place really since 2005. We want to argue that this turmoil since 2005 has to be read not simply as a reaction against Thaksin, but as a reaction against the eruption of new forces into Thai politics. Reaction has come from the old oligarchy and from large sections of the urban middle class. The military has returned to active political involvement through the 2006 coup, <coughs> through massive interference in elections, particularly in the 2007 election, probably the most corrupt election in Thai history, corrupted by the military using public money, and through propaganda campaigns, through intrigue, and through strengthening its own institutional power. Royalists have also been prominent in the reaction. The cry of monarchy in danger was used to rally a disparate coalition against Taksin, and no effort was made from above to prevent this. Leaders of the reaction also made explicit appeal to the class interests of the urban middle class. The whole discourse of class was brought into this conflict, not by the lower echelons, but by the middle class saying we need to defend ourselves, arguing that they would lose power and privilege if the political system became more responsive to mass demands. In the political movements that stemmed from the 1970s, the Thai middle class has generally been analysed as a spearhead of the pressure to control the military, stifle dictatorship and promote elective democracy. In much of the theorising about democracy, the middle class plays a prominent role, the whole democratic transitions literature. But it is clear that in Thailand, large parts of the urban middle class have had second thoughts. This is often explained as a revulsion against Thaksin and his corruption. But the debate has begun, begun much beyond just removing Thaksin to contemplate qualifying or abandoning elective democracy altogether. Over recent years, several proposals have been made. 
One of the first, encapsulated in a 2005 book entitled Royal Powers, was to increase the powers of the monarchy as a counterweight against, quote, corrupt elective politicians. The details of the scheme are fuzzy, but they seem to entail enhancing the monarch's power of veto and appointment. The political scientist Annette Lautamatat, in a 2006 book, proposed upweighting the power of the monarchy and what he called the aristocracy, but which mainly meant the military, bureaucracy, and judiciary. And you can see that many of the reforms imp implemented by the post-2006 coup government largely followed Enex ideas, reducing the power of parliament in favour of the bureaucracy and judiciary, vastly increasing the power of the military through a new Internal Security Act, and so on. In 2007, Santi and PAD, the, the yellow shirts, <coughs> floated the idea of abandoning the principle of one person, one vote, and constituting the parliament by a mixture of appointment and election by occupational and other groups. PAD has consistently tried to delegitimize the parliament and the electorate by arguing that the mass of voters are uneducated and hence elect corrupt politicians who then misgovern. Several figures have promoted, floated proposals for a national government, several in the last few weeks, which ultimately means an appointed government, an installation of the old oligarchy. Over the past year, there's been almost constant rumours of schemes to manufacture a crisis in which this proposal could be brought forward, particularly the uh, uh, fomenting, fomenting conflict on the border with Cambodia, in which you could actually create a state of war in which you could then over you could go for a new kind of system. The red shirt movement has emerged to counter this conservative reaction. It's a rather complex movement. The original core, which emerged in 2006, were activist groups particularly made up of old leftists who were the first to come out in open opposition to the coup of 2006. They were then joined by former of supporters of Thaksin from his core areas of support in Bangkok, the Upper North and the Northeast. But over time, the movement has attracted more and more former democracy activists and ordinary citizens who, are just, who had in the past been opposed to Thaksin, but are fed up with the return to military influence. The main demand of this movement from the beginning was to restore democracy by holding elections. After an election was held in 2007, that demand dropped, but when that government was then overthrown by a kind of judicial coup in late 2008, it returned. A secondary demand has been to revive the 1997 constitution, which means setting aside the charter written after the 2006 coup. The major strategy of the red shirt movement has been to hold mass rallies and to use the color red to emphasize the sheer, sheer size of their support, whether in stadium rallies like this or in street processions. In March to May of last year, the red shirt movement reached a kind of peak when thousands streamed into Bangkok in a, an atmosphere which can only be described as carnival and drew enthusiastic support from parts of the city population and sympathy from even from some in the army. But over a two-month protest, they were tactically outmaneuvered by the army, resulting in a violent end to the protest, which probably diminished their support somewhat. Despite this repression, the movement has not been cowed. And this is really very important. When you've had this kind of repression against popular politics in the past, it's worked, and it, things have tended to dissipate and go away, and people hide. But the red shirt movement has to is totally uncowed by the two incidents of the last two years. Over the past year, the red shirt movement has concentrated on local organization, political schools, and developing means of communication through print and through radio. Let us now look at the possible upcoming election, and first look at the background of election results over the past decade. The election system which has been in place has two parts. It has territorial constituencies, which, has been, which were 400 of them in 2001-2005. Average vote in a constituency is about 75,000. And then 100 votes 
100 seats, which is known as the party list, which is a national vote by party. It's changed a bit in the last election, but think of it that way. This was the result in 2001, when Thaksin came to power. In all of these charts, <coughs> the red part, the red constituencies, means the pro Thaksin party, in this case, Thai Rak Thai. And the blue is the Democrats, the head of the current ruling uh, coalition. And the, so yes, this bit here is Bangkok. This is Greater Bangkok, which fits in there, but is expanded because, of, of course, it's higher population density. What you can see in this poll is that uh, Thaksin does very well in uh, very large parts of Bangkok, particularly in the, particularly in the upper north, and that here things are really still very scattered. We are still in the old system when many small localised parties held sway. Thai Rak Thai won around two-fifths of the vote and just short of an absolute majority. <clears throat> the Democrats do dominated the south and the western hills. The northeast was still utterly fragmented. This changed totally by 2005. The end of his four-year term, Thaksin not only did what no other Thai prime minister had done, which was to get to last for a four-year term to go to an election, but he won a complete and utter landslide. Most of the little parties, which we saw in the previous chart, had disappeared, usually absorbed into his party, moving towards a two-party system. Only the green one, Chak Thai, survived. The Democrat party held the south, but collapsed just about everywhere else. Thai Rak Thai dominated the north, Northeast Centre, and significantly Bangkok. We're here now in 2005, and Thaksin has still got very, he sweeps Bangkok, all except two seats, to the Democrats in the very centre. The poll in 2006 was boycotted by the opposition and eventually scrapped by the courts. So only one party was standing, so it's more like a, a referendum. So we can, uh, we, all we can do is measure the strength of the vote for Thai Rak Thai. So the more, the redder the, the shading, the higher the percentage of vote. And you can see it's clearly higher in the northeast now, the two areas of concentration. The northeast, it's clearly higher in the northeast, particularly the central part and the upper north, up here. Up here. If we compare the 2006 poll to the 2005 poll, we can see the, the polarization. In the, red, the parts that are shaded red, the actual absolute number of votes for Thai Rak Thai increased between 2005 and 2006. And if it's in blue, and the heavier the blue, it, 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 it reduced. So you can see polarization. In the areas that are supportive of Thaksin, his voting is getting even stronger. Even now, he's now he himself is now under attack, and everywhere else, it is declining. In 2007, the post-coup constitution had returned to a multi-member constituency system, so you can't map it in the same way. You have to map each MP as a dot, so we have to draw it differently. If you put lines on the map, it starts to make more sense. The vote for PPP, which is now the successor to Thai Rak Thai, was back roughly to the same level as 2001. But what is mostly interesting is that the regional pattern is now very, very clear. Thaksin's party wins in, wins in the upper north, <coughs> the northeast, and around Bangkok, the outskirts of Bangkok here, whereas the Democrats win in the south and the central part of the capital. <coughs> the centre and lower north are very fragmented, returning to the old pattern of voting for local favourites, irrespective of party. But one very interesting thing to do with this map is to compare it to a map of ethno-linguistic groups. And as you can see, the line that is cutting down here, essentially between this central part and the Taksin book, Taksin head, is almost, it, in an uncanny way, uh, follows the line that divides the ethno-linguistic groups in Thailand. What this means is, the bit in green in the middle is the speakers of central Thai, if you like, the area of old Siam. The, and those in the darker red at the north, this is Khammun, and the, the sort of red out here, this is basically Isan Lao. Okay? And the, the, these are sort of crossover areas, and this is Khmer. But as you can see very clearly, uh, the support for Thaksin is at its strongest in these areas which were 
parts that were incorporated into Siam by fundamentally by conquest in the 19th century. There are kind of things underneath what is going on now which are not always very explicit. What then is the situation with the parties? <coughs> Taksin's party now runs as per Thai. This was the situation <coughs> in the parliament after the last <coughs> change in late 2008. Per Thai is still the largest party with 189. But the coalition that was set up by the military in, in December 2008, headed by the Democrats with a slightly lower number, and then a number of smaller parties which were put together in a, in a coalition. <coughs> what then is the situation of the parties going into this election? Taksin's party is in something of a mess. The leader is still in self-exile. Many of its former MPs <coughs> are still under a five-year ban from politics. In many localities, there are strains between the parties, MPs, and the red shirts. The red shirt <laughs> agitators are complaining <coughs> that the MPs did not give them enough support over the demonstrations of, uh, particularly of last year. But still, the chances of the party should not be underestimated. Just in the last few days, Taksin has pushed his younger sister, Ying Lak, to become party leader for the election campaign. She doesn't have much political experience. Probably her greatest asset is that she smiles all the time. But she will put the Shinawat surname on the ballot. And that, I think, could be magic. It could significantly increase the party's showing. I think it will be very interesting what will, what will happen with her in the next few weeks. There will be sort of attempts, I think, to try and undermine her in one way or another. The Democrats have undergone a kind of revolution over the last year. They've completely abandoned their old passive, minimalist, laissez-faire approach to policy and have copied virtually every part of Tuxin's populist platform. They have not yet delivered it, however, in the same way. Tuxin said, this is yours by right, and people like that. The, Dax the Democrats say, like the old bureaucrats, we give you this as a present, patronage style. And, and, and the Democrats still don't seem to understand that there is a huge difference to that in today's mass politics. They have made some very interesting changes to the electoral laws, shifting seats, allowing themselves to redraw constituency boundaries that could significantly increase their chances. They have a lot of army back backing and they have mainstream media support. This, if, if any, is their chance to get somewhere near a majority in the parliament. But that's still probably unlikely. But there's a third very interesting element. The Boom Jai Thai or Thai Pride Party is a return of an old formula. Big business money, influence in the bureaucracy, political wheeler dealers and military backing. The big business backing comes especially from two firms with interests in Bangkok's airport, which has been a honeypot pot of corruption for a decade now. King Power that runs the duty free and the Sino Thai construction firm that built the airport link. In the current coalition, this party got control of the interior ministry and has used that position to put supportive officials, governors and police chiefs in key constituencies important in this election. The effective leader of the party, Nguyen Chit Cho, is expert at using money to lure candidates and votes. So this is going into this election with the Democrats who are sort of policy side and look like the nice guys. They have a, a, a leader who has eaten in Oxford and can speak wonderful English. And beside them is this party that can play dirty old-fashioned politics of buying up support or, or coercing support in one way or another. There are then several smaller parties, of which probably the most interesting is Perpendin for the motherland, a party that was invented, created, by the army in 2007 and still could serve as a way for the military to put exert influence over the election again this time. What then, the result is very hard to foretell. From past experience, polling data is pretty faulty. Lots of people in Thailand lie to pollsters deliberately. And recent by-elections are not a good guide. The tumultuous events of the past four years mean that results at the last polls need not be much of a guide. So what's the range of possibilities? First, Per Thai, the Taksin party, could win a majority or a large plurality as in 2007, giving them the first chance to form a government. 
Would they then try to rehabilitate Taksin? They've more or less said they would. Would the army allow this result to stand? And if not, what would they do? This is obviously highly problematic. After you've overthrown three governments, can you do it a fourth time and get away with it? Second alternative is, of course, a strong Democrat victory, either a majority or a strong plurality, making it possible to form a single party or virtual single party government. The Democrats will campaign on the platform that this result alone holds out prospects for stability. However, if they were to get in this situation, would it put them in a position to be heavier suppression of the Red Movement and their opponents, or would it put them in a position they're confident enough to really move towards some kind of reconciliation? It's very far from clear. Many people think that the result will actually be a return to something like the current Democrat-headed coalition, in which a lot of small parties are needed for support, and the military has plenty of scope to play politics in the background. And the fourth opportunity is still an accident. What I mean by that is something that happens that means you don't have to hold a poll. I was saying in 2006, I thought this time we would have a postmodern coup, not an old-fashioned coup, but then, of course, the army ran the, the tanks in the style of 1958 and had the most old-fashioned coup we have ever seen. But this time, I think, maybe you could have something more elegant. Suppose that the moment Apisit calls an election, the whole election commission resigns. This has been floated as a possibility. You then create a constitutional crisis that has to be, uh, has to be solved, perhaps by the intervention of the monarchy or the military or something. Some of this is still possible. Whatever the result, this election is not an ending of any kind. Since the riots of Songkran 2009, and even more since May last year, there has been fitful talk of reconciliation. But this reflects the old myth of a unified, harmonious society that can somehow be recovered. In reality, new political forces have challenged the way power, public goods, and social respect has been distributed in, in the past. The main agenda of the Red Shirts is return to a system abandoned for the last six years, where elections determine who governs. But their fuller agenda demands a much more widespread overhaul of the political system, further decentralisation, end to the immunity for officialdom, scrutiny of the judiciary, controls on the military, guarantees for freedom of speech, and much more. At present, the main strategy of the Red Shirts is still to demand the return of Taksin, as he was the leader who worked for them in the past, so they still see him as the most effective mechanism. This challenge will not be resolved in a short period of time. The challenge to the absolute monarchy in 1932 was not really resolved until 1958, and the challenge issued to military dictatorship in 1973 was not resolved until the constitution of 1997. This process will take a long term, long time, and its course and results are beyond prediction. At present, however, the old oligarchy and the urban middle class has reacted very strongly against this challenge. They have mobilised the symbolic power of the monarchy in order to, to gear up wide support, and in so, do, do, so doing, have already done huge damage to the institution. This strategy has virtually outlived its usefulness. In the literature on democratization and de democratic transitions, some 15 to 20 years ago, Thailand figured among the countries undergoing transition. Since the rise of Thaksin, and especially since the 2006 coup, it has often been labelled as a hybrid regime, combining elements of democracy and authoritarianism, yet still assuming that it is on the right path in the long run. But maybe we need to accept that its current position may actually be permanent. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. I'll open the floor and let you field your own questions. I have one to start. Uh, you raised the interesting point that the, <clears throat> that the current government has mimicked Toxin's policies, but is delivering them in this patronizing manner. And the question is why? Is it just political ineptitude, or is there sort of a deeper uh, paradigm shift problem, uh, or fears, fears of changing a discourse from one about uh, beneficence to one about acknowledging rights? 
Okay. The, the question is, is why the Democrats, uh, while they adopted Thaksin's policies, have not adopted his style of delivering them? Well, um, I, I think um, uh, that this new government, particularly the Democrat, uh, the leader, the, the prime, our prime minister, come from a different, uh, different background altogether. And he's an Eton educated, he's uh, Oxford educated, and come from quite well-to-do uh, middle class background in Bangkok. He doesn't have he doesn't uh, doesn't have the uh, the feeling uh, for for the, for the people. Maybe he have the feeling, but he doesn't really know how to how to express it. And uh, so that the way he uh, 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 behave. It's like uh, he come from a, a bureaucracy, or he's is someone high up there and giving patronage to the people. Uh, in other words, I don't. He hasn't yet got into uh, to understand that politics is about passion. Politics is also about how you can uh, bring the people uh, to accept you as their leader, as the leader that they can touch. I think at the moment the people feel uh, they cannot touch him at all. And this is something to do with, with his upbringing, with uh, where he come from, and so you, 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 you get the Democrat in this position. And some of the people in the party is a little bit like that too. Uh, even Chuan Dik Pai who come from ordinary person, but you know, ordinary family, but his behavior is very bureaucratic. He's always stand off from the people. But you see, Thaksin is, is completely different. He comes from a rich family, but then he uh, mm. embraced the people and make the people feel that uh, he come from them or uh, he belong to them rather than coming from somewhere and giving things to them. It's a, maybe it's a question of class issue here. I think you were first. Um, I totally agree with you that the next election is not the end of any kind. So can you propose any solution to the chronic Thai political problem? Because if the lecture, oh, I mean, if the Democrat Party win, the lecture will protest <coughs> again, mm. I uh, believe. And if the Thai, Thai Lak Thai or any new name <laughs> of them win, <laughs> So the yellow shirt uh, <coughs> have a high possibility to portray the game. So is there any solution to that problem? The question is, can we propose a solution to yeah. the current, the current, uh, the current Thai political problem? Uh -huh. I, I think uh, I would like to say that I think this is not a very short process at all. I think we're talking about a process of change now which will take 20 to 30 years maybe even to work out. Maybe it'll go a little bit quicker than that. Um, I, well, I think a very interesting uh, parallel to take is between the Chartist movement in the UK, which was a demand basically for the franchise, which sort of came up in the 1830s and dribbled on to the 1880s, going up and going down and so on. A little explosion, now it will go away, it will reform again, another leader will appear and so on and so forth. I don't think it will take that long, but I think people who are now saying, please find a solution for me, are still working in this old kind of, you know, the bureaucrats are able to, we, all, we can somehow manage this. We can write another constitution, we can f fiddle with the, the moving parts of this system somehow, and it will all settle down. I don't think it's that way. I think we're in the middle of a major historical change, which at this point, uh, the, old, the forces in power in the society have said, no, we're going to block it as far as we can, and you have to get over that process somehow. It may happen now, it may happen later. But I don't think anyone at this point can hand down a solution which will send everything back to being nice and calm again. I think this is a fantasy that people should get away from, that you should uh, accept the fact you're in a, a momentous historical change and, and go with it. Yeah, may, may I add a little? I think we have to, uh, we have to accept that uh, we are now in a, you know, a parliamentary system with the constitution, and so we should, uh, we should uh, obey the rule. The politics ha must have a rule, and so if the Pua Thai win, 
I think you know the the process that process should allow to uh, work itself out, and um, if there is chaos, then uh, the authority should uh, uh, apply the law. If the demonstrators abridge the law, then they should they should do something about it rather than uh, allowing. Uh, favor to happen for certain demonstrators and not the others. In other words, stop these uh, uh, multiple standards. Okay? For example, in the U.S., just see in the U.S., a lot of people don't want Obama to be the, the president, but after he won, they will accept and allow him to um, rule for, for, the, for the time period he, he could, and then uh, wait for the next election. Now, I think Thailand will have to come to terms with the issue of the rule of law. Play within the rule, rather than wishing that we don't want Pu Thai and we would support the, the military to make a coup, or we would support the uh, PAD to come out to uh, have a demonstration, and the other way around too. Yes, I but th that's a difficult. I agree with that, but the big problem is that the winner can change the rule and also set the rule in Thailand. Yes, of course, of course. That's part so, of. But when you're the winner, you're allowed to do that. Yeah. Okay. So you you may not like that, and some people won't like that. But that's the rules. Okay. That's the way. That will happen. Um, I do have a question, but first I want to just follow up on the young man's comment. Uh, I think you have described the uh, current uh, prime minister. Uh, I assume he's called the prime minister. Um, yes. He, you were describing him being from a, um, a wealthy family and trying to appeal to the lower classes. Uh, I was thinking you must have a Thai word that's similar to one that we have in English, which is lip service. Would you say that he's just sort of appealing to them in, in a form of just giving them lip service to... He doesn't really mean it. He has no intention of seeking... Mm. I don't think so. I think he... I, I, to be fair to him, I think he... He means a lot of what he says, mm. but um, he doesn't really understand the psychology of politics, that the, the mass, the, the, the mass politics, the psychology of the mass politics. And uh, you know, if you stand in front of him, he will move a little away from you. Mm. You know, there, there, there is no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to, how to. You know, you can only think of uh, Nehru in India. He also was brought up like this, mm -hmm. and before he uh, could embrace the people, he had traveled on his own for a year amongst uh, the ordinary people and then work with them mm -hmm. to, so that he can appreciate them, understand them, and know how to embrace them. I don't think our politicians who come from this sort of background have had that uh, experience, and certainly uh, Kun uh, Abhisit had had some experience talking to people in the urban area of Bangkok, but not very much in the countryside. My, my real question actually oh, was, sorry. My real question was, uh, you had the uh, courts throw out one election, you had the military overthrow another. It seems that um, whoever has the military on their side will really determine the election, or is that as the military shifted? So the question is, is it that whoever has the military on their side can determine the election? Well, I mean, you, you have, what happened in 2007 was, uh, this was up when the coup government came to an end and they went back to an electoral system. Um, the military tried extremely hard to win that election uh, with the, for the Democrats, fundamentally. Um, to the point of forming political parties, funding political parties, sending s soldiers to stand intimidatingly by ballot boxes on polling day, uh, doing, uh, doing uh, a lot of uh, propaganda on military radio, and radio television, sort of dirty tricks to try and undermine the opposition, all those things. And they still couldn't win. Right? They still, uh, in fact, uh, did better than they might have thought, but were still not in a position to prevent the pro-Taxin party having the, the plurality, the largest plurality, and therefore the first chance to form a government. Now, the question is now, nobody really knows what will come out, the result right now. So, but if 
which is one possibility, we will go to an election. There would again be this similar att attempt to try and influence the result before it, before it happens, but there is still also the op opportunity that might not work. So there are many unknowns here, many unknowns. But undoubtedly, uh, <coughs> the, the, the position of the military is now stronger than at any t stronger and more important for determining the politics than any time that it has been since 1992 and probably since the 19, 1970s. And that has come about because of, of many things, because of the way they changed the laws under the coup government, because of new repressive laws they brought in, bringing back ISOC, the old body which used to be there in the past of the times of the repression of the communist insurgency, they've brought it back now, essentially seeing it as to stop politics, to stop popular politics. So they are now an incredibly institutionally powerful position. So yes, they are. They are the people. Uh, <clears throat> there is also a possibility of a wild card in the sense that, you know, mm. if as time goes by, if the situation is such that poor Thai with Ying Lak as the head of the party, uh, showing a good prospect of winning a huge majority. There could be some change on the other side, the Democrat. Because if the Democrat is really very serious about uh, being part of the, the next uh, government, uh, they may have to try to do something like changing the leader of the party. Because politics in Thailand is never, you, it's so difficult, it's a paradox. and. Uh, uh, no, no one is really, uh, uh, there's a Thai word, no one is the real enemies or, uh, of each other. Uh, some kind of coalition could always happen. And you can imagine a situation where the Democrat completely uh, decided that uh, they want to save democracy and forget about the military and the people behind them and said, okay, uh, let's do something so that we could have a coalition with Pua Thai. That's a wild card, another wild card that can happen, I think. But we have to wait and see. Oh, sorry, this is over here. Is he speaking to you? Yes. Um, two questions. At one point, you showed a map of ethno uh, linguistic groups. Um, and uh, it makes me wonder whether there's something essential about their ethno linguistic character, or is it more a matter of their mode of incorporation into the the nation state, and then if we take into account mode of incorporation, uh, does this ethno-linguistic category uh, at all relevant? Um, the second question it has to do with the monarchy. So, to, I mean, to be uh, crass, if the king were 20 years younger than he is now, would any of, we would be having any of this kind of conversation. So is there something about a sense of stability with the monarchy that is that is driving much of the story Can because the monarchy second. shows up a little bit in the story that you tell, Can but, you repeat that but not very much. Mm -hmm. First question is, you know, how does the, the distribution of ethno-linguistic groups affect uh, the p political affiliations? It is, as you say, the second, as you said, it's, the, it's because of the nature of their, of their incorporation into the nation state. So uh, if you go back to the late 19th century, the areas in the north and the northeast were still referred to by the Bangkok elite as Lao. And that was like being calling them second class citizens, or even if you know it, almost sort of conquered citizens as, as, as well. And although, of course, over time that those sort of attitudes have have softened somewhat, they're still very much there in the background. And what you see in that picture in there you know, with the person saying uneducate people is a reflection of that same idea. People who come from the Northeast are uneducated, they're buffaloes and so on. So it's, it's there. I mean, that's the way that division is now reflected into modern, modern attitudes. Bangkok people feel themselves, uh, Bangkok middle class people feel themselves to be superior. People out in the North and Northeast hate this, resent this terribly. They've never been able to say this before. It's been part of the repression in the political culture. But now suddenly they can. And this, of course, is very, uh, very shocking. The second, the, second, the second question is whether if the, the monarch uh, was 20 years younger than he happens to be, would this make the tensions any less? Well, it's, you're referring to the issue of succession. Now, people fear Thaksin uh, returning or Pertai party uh, 
uh, having a ma ma majority so much. Uh, maybe it's related to the issue of succession in this way. Uh, some people said they fear that uh, Thaksin, Thaksin had good relationship with uh, uh, prospective next monarch. And if uh, him or uh, uh, his derived party uh, became a government, then uh, there, is high, there is a possibility that he could return to Thailand. Thaksin could return under a new uh, and under a new Thaksin, reign. Thaksin could return to Thailand under a new reign, and will create, he will create havoc in Thai society because the two side, the the yellow who dislike him, would come out in the street, and the red would come out in support of him. So there will be great chaos. And a lot of people also believe that uh, Thaksin uh, will not come as a passive person, and he will come and will enter politics again, because a pardon would be that he could run election again. So uh, this is uh, one way of expressing the fear of Thaksin and how it might be linked to the issue of succession. Some people think this is the major, uh, major issue behind the current turmoil. No, we think it's an added complication and that the, the issue of mass politics is a much bigger issue. The monarchy is just being mobilized to, to, as, part of the, as part of the opposition to this big social change that's going yeah, on, yeah. and the succession is complicating it. Right. In other words, we think that uh, what's happening in Thailand now, uh, since Saxon came into power, uh, it, uh, he has shown that a popular politics could work for a majority of people, and that that idea of parliament, parliamentary democracy is kind of getting established in Thailand. But that has challenged the position of the middle class to fear that if that will become the norm in Thailand, that they themselves will lose the control of the political process because of the politics of numbers. So they will try to prolong or change that development. Okay. Professor Wei's question was, his first question was more or less my question, but um, to tack onto that a little bit, about the South, uh, does did the South just not have the same sort of history as the Northeast and the North in relation to the center, or is there something else going on? Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the, the question. Yeah, yes. Is the, how is the South different from the, the, the North and the Northeast? Yes, because in a sense the South is, is also an area that was incorporated quite, quite, quite late, but not so late. The South is really very, very different socioeconomically. If you talk of North and Northeast, you're talking about a base of peasant agriculture, small-scale small agriculture. In the peninsula South, that's a relatively minor part. Uh, it's much more urbanized. You have, you have city, towns and cities in, in this area that you can trace back 2,000 years, you know, back to Chinese sources and, and that. So, um, its major occupations are plantations, mining, fishing, and so on. They tend to be, they, they, they're much larger, they're much sort of larger scale op op operations. The, its population is far less Thai, you know, it's got a much more cosmopolitan population, particularly having a very uh, high concentration of Chinese, or you know, Chinese who have blended into the population, not just over the last hundred years, but over the last 500 years, I mean, coming for a long, long, t a long, long time. So it's both sort of ethnically and economically very, very different from these other areas. But I think the most important part of it is, it's just simply much more urbanized. You have these well-established, most of the people, not most people, a very high proportion of the people live in rather well-established towns which have got a much more developed civil society than you have uh, in the other parts of the country where still fundamentally peasant agriculture and the towns are really very new. Right. that um, in the democratization literature, the middle class are typically um, forces for democracy, but in Thailand's case, uh, you mentioned that they align themselves more with the upper, upper classes. Can you tell a little bit more about why that is? So I know you mentioned that um, you feel that their interests um, would, be, would be affected by uh, having a pro-taxing party. 
identity and power. But um, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the role that is, like how, how cognizant and what that concern is among the, the middle class. And also when you, you discuss you know, these cultural stereotypes, um, kind of, so what's the group, so why would they align themselves with the middle class and not with the lower classes? Or, you know, and is it just because of geography, is it stereotypes, um, mm -hmm. that they're absolutely small numbers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, why has the middle class politics seemed to turn against uh, democracy? What is, this, what is the background behind it? Um, I think there are uh, many things. I think one is, if you, look at the, if you look at the pattern of economic development of Thailand over the last 50 years yeah, and the society that it has created, um, and you compare it to one of the things another paper we've done is to compare it particularly to Japan and Korea at uh, different, at similar stages of development. What you, what you see is um, that Thailand, by relying so heavily on foreign direct investment and export-oriented uh, manufacture, has developed a rather unusual society. It has a very small working class, maybe 8 or 10 percent, you know, people who are actually working in, in big factories, who are actually producing most of the wealth, which is, you know, by exports, okay? Um, you, you then have quite a small professional middle class, professional managerial <coughs> bureaucratic class, to, which is basically created to service this economy. But it's no more than, you can calculate it different ways, 15, so you know, 13, 15, 17 percent, you can calculate it in different ways. And if you look at, you know, Japan and Korea at, 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 at parallel times, it's at least twice that, that size, where you had much bigger, uh, you had much bigger industrialization, much bigger working class, and also much bigger managerial class. And then what Thailand has got is two-thirds of its people still uh, who are either doing two things. They're either doing agriculture, which is now, you know, they don't, it's very complicated, but they're still doing agriculture, or they're in the informal sector. That means a lot of them are migrating back and forth between the country and the city. They're working as vendors, casual labor, small businesses, and these sorts of things. They're not in the, they're not in the you know, tax-paying, uh, social security-covered formal economy. Um, and what I, I think what has happened, I think the other part, the, the other part about the, this middle class is that it's small. <clears throat> it's very largely sino thai So it's very largely uh, from families, most of whom uh, who have arrived in Thailand over the last two or three generations. And we forget now, because the sino thai in the last 20 years have become so well established in Thailand, they've become, they now run everything. They now run, run the urban economy, whether it's the Ajahn or the military or whatever. It's very heavily Sino Thai. You go back to the 1980s, you remember the Sino Thai was still complaining about being distributed against, still complaining about being second class citizens, and so on. So their sort of habilitation to be so central to the society is very recent. So, the, the, if you like, the cultural memory uh, is obviously still there. And I think this. Uh, this, uh, this contributes enormously to th this insecurity which is driving some of the way they're responding to these politics. And remember that Sonti, Sonti Limtongun, who became the great leader of the Yellow Shirts in 2006, 2000, 2007, deliberately positioned himself as a good Chinese. I mean, he went out of his way Luke to position Jean himself. Rakcha. No, yeah, was it? Luke Jean, Luke Jean Rakcha. Rakcha. We sons of China love, love the country and defend the king. I mean, it was absolutely explicit. And he wears this funny hat, which makes himself, you know, look like a Tauke, You know, um, very, very deliberate use of the symbols as well. Yeah. Uh, can, can I add? I uh, just give you an example. Uh, uh, there's always an economic aspect to to all this. Uh, the middle, the urban Thai middle class have been so used to being able to benefit from 99, uh, 95. 9% of the, the total budget every year until, until the decentralization uh, institute uh, in the 1997 constitution, which stipulated that from now on, uh, there will have to be a process of relocation of uh, the annual budget to the countryside up to 35% of the total budget by such and such year. And uh, even 
and this shows you that the people have got so used to being dominant in every area, including the budget. And then recently, the issue of, of fis fiscal reform, tax reform has come into the fore when, uh, when it now become clear that the government has to take up the populist policies, which now turn into welfare or social security policies, uh, which mean that uh, the government has to find the revenue from somewhere. So there's now talk about fiscal reform. And what is the reaction from some of the economists who work in big banks? They come out to say, you cannot do that because the tax reform would mean there will be an increase in tax on us who pay most of the taxation and who is going to benefit from tax. Not us, it's the people out there. And so they said, go slow on this. And this will reduce uh, economic development, will reduce Thailand economic growth. And this, this kind of talk is now going on and it, it receives a lot of rapport from uh, the urban middle class. So there is an economic issue of the allocation of resources in the process of democratization. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the allocation of those resources. You know, I mean, you've been talking about the Gini coefficients and the inequality in society, but then also speaking about how uh, much of the benefits of growth are going to the southeast or to the urban parts where there still uh, seems to be a lot of structural inefficiencies that keep people uh, in the poor classes, specifically thinking here about the uh, aristocratic nature of the bureaucracy. If there's any talk about reforming these sectors to um, move away from the often socially destructive uh, redistribution of wealth towards the more creation of wealth. Uh, the question is, has there been uh, an attempt to move away from this concentration of wealth to redistributive uh, wealth uh, uh, policies. Uh, the when the Democrat came to power two years ago, they one one of all the policy platform they adopted was uh, fiscal reform, and they wanted to introduce um, uh, de development tax, which means that uh, people who have in order to uh, reduce the speculation of land, which means that uh, people who have land and do nothing on it will pay a little bit higher tax than uh, people who uh, make use of those land. And the difference is not very great you know, in terms of the gradation of the increase in the taxation. And uh, in the beginning, everybody was very excited about that, but only a month ago, uh, they have decided, before this election came, they have decided to set aside that. The process has started to process this in the parliament, but uh, they now said they're going withdrawing that. On, on institutional reform, um, there was a, a movement that uh, in the in the early two thousands, uh, early uh, sorry, in the nineteen ninety late nineteen nineties, particularly under the Democrat government of Chuan, to reform the military. Um, and it is at earlier stages of this too. The military is very oversized. There are what, 1,600 generals, of perhaps which only 200 of them actually have a job to do. And all kind, there's all kinds of, of problems. There's enormous problems over um, um, purchasing of weapons and all these kinds of things. There's, there's, but in, in the end, and there's lots of promises, there are reform plans picked up, the military squashed it all. Absolutely, totally, there's been really no downsizing, no reduction in the number of generals. And since they have came back into influence in 2006, they've multiplied the budget, military budget by 50% already and got enormous. They're now trying to buy submarines, for Christ's sake. Um, Second-hand submarines. Second-hand submarines. Mm -hmm. To go with the aircraft carrier, which goes nowhere, the airship, which goes nowhere, and now we have the submarines. Uh, so, and then uh, Taksin came in with... Uh, his, in many ways, his major um, campaign issue when he came in, in in 2000 was reform of the bureaucracy. He set himself up as saying, you know, all these other people are still in this bureaucratic culture. I'm a businessman. I'm going to change this whole bureaucratic culture by doing, turning it into a more business oriented. And he, he, had, he used this phrase, CEO. We have to turn them into CEO ambassadors, CEO governors. He brought the officials all in and got you know, business school people to lecture them and tell them how they were going to change. He set up a whole process for changing the structure of the bureaucracy and all of this. And of course, that part of throwing him out was to stop that. 
A lot of the opposition to him came from the bureaucracy which did not want to be uh, reformed in this way. So that now is dormant and the bureaucrats are back in spades. Um, I think this police culture of mine influences a lot of Thai new generation become interested in politics because from my own experience, I, I never become interested in politics before this, this crisis. So do you have any recommendation or suggestion for the new Thai generation that they can go back and have uh, improve in any issue or to sustainable development? Uh, the, question, no, you do. the question is, is there any advice for the Thai new generation who are getting more involved in politics? You have to answer that. Uh, <laughs> 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 like <laughs> well, you know, you have to go with the time because uh, you cannot go back uh, globally, you know, although democracy, parliamentary democracy um, may have its flaw and in some countries people become disillusioned with it, but uh, it has proven that uh, it has, it is the most efficient um, uh, system that uh, could help us uh, um, manage conflicts in a period of this quick change. Hmm? So that uh, I think we should, we should try to stick to it and improve it along the way rather than using uh, um, other, methods. other methods or military intervention which uh, is shunned uh, globally. Okay. Oh. One, one of the uh, impressive things about the, uh, the 2007 election was how much solidarity it was among the red shirts that, that um, despite the 18 being banned, um, they, they still voted as, uh, as a block for, 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 for the tie. Um, and now we're on the C team, the, the, now we're on the B team's been banned, we're on the C team. Um, uh, Wondering what your sense of, of, of sort of the level of solidarity and the likelihood that the, that that collection of, of interest will stick together, or the likelihood that it'll fragment, and, and if so, what ways would you see that fragmentation occur? So the question is how how, how likely it is that the Thai will be more fragmented this time than it was in in two thousand and seven. Uh, yes, there are certainly uh, some considerable problems. Um, for instance, we went to. Uh, one part of the, the northeast a few months ago where there clearly was a lot of tension between the red shirt activists in the town and the Pertai MPs because of what had happened in, in, in May 2010 last year. However, you have to say, what, what you've, you've been reading the Bangkok press carefully in the last couple of months, there have been considerable attempts within Pertai to accommodate the red shirts to negotiate this thing rather than to you know, have it turn out a mess. I think there is a danger that if you read the Bangkok press now, they're very anxious to play up this kind of theme because the most extraordinary thing throughout this whole affair is that the Bangkok press thinks that people in Bangkok don't want to read anything except good news and they want to read bad news about people they hate and good news about people they love rather than knowing what's going on. Right? <laughs> and it's really quite extraordinary. <laughs> so we never have any, you know, we have this extraordinary organization and everything else going on outside and you know, the Bangkok has got its blinkers on, it's not even looking at it. So I think you, all of these stories that come out all the time about, oh, there's a, there's a lot of mess inside the party, don't listen too much. Uh, let me add, my informant in Mahasarakam, uh, I talked to him uh, just before I came here, uh, said that I asked him on this question, and he said that, um, well, let's talk about the ordinary people on the ground. What are they doing? They are, they are certainly excited about the election, mm -hmm. but they also know that um, uh, even though Pua Thai get the majority, uh, they may not be able to form a government. So they are forming groups among themselves. These are ordinary people, the villagers. You know, they have groups, particularly after the, the incident in, in April and May last year. Uh, they, they meet regularly to discuss the politics. And they, they're talking among themselves, what is the significance of this election? How should we, how should we view it? And uh, some of them would say, even if we lose, this is very important because it's a chance to show our preference. It's a chance to show our stand where we are. And so there are a lot of these discussions going on. And uh, obviously, uh, there, 
a lot of resentment against the local MPs who did not help them after the incident because a lot of these MPs were just sitting on a, you know, like a on the fence uh, on the fence to see where things are going, and so some of them would say they don't want to support that those MP anymore, uh, but some some are saying, uh, but then uh, they are expecting the party may uh, change some candidate. Uh, certainly there was some shifting to Pum Jai Thai mm -hmm. because it's also very interesting to watch what kind of uh, campaign tactics that Pum Jai Thai is going to use. And the change of the, uh, what do you call the change? Electro of the system. The electro system, which happened before now, have been designed in such a way that it will benefit smaller party like Pum Jai Thai, who uh, may not be able to win the whole larger, uh, uh, and th then they will take up some. And uh, Poon Jai Thai is also buying up a lot of the MPs to move to them. And there will be some in the red who will move with them because people mm -hmm. still have the loyalty uh, to some of these local MPs.